Thank you again, as I said, uh, for the invitation. Um, today, what I have in mind to present, I think is quite a challenge in the sense that uh, I'm gonna summarize uh, work uh, that will be in my next uh, book. I can uh, hear, probably. so all right, that would be, uh, so that's the title of my talk, The Aesthetic Use of Taxonomy Knowledge-Oriented Yogas. And that would, I mean, as I said, summarizes work that I present in my next book to be published at Brill. Uh, it's about 400 pages long. So the, yeah, the idea of summarizing this up, you know, on just the topic of aesthetics in 30 minutes has been uh, quite a challenge, but I think I managed and uh, basically the content or the progression yeah, we go in eight topics, including the uh, introduction, uh, talk about spiritual exercise, about list making as ritual, the basic framework of spiritual exercise in Gnostic yoga, general reflection on taxonomy in the science and the humanities, the taxonomical contemplation as philosophical practice in South Asian Gnostic spiritual exercise, then some historical markers and main currents of South Asian Gnostic yoga, just to define it for those who are not specialists, of course. Um, and then I have an example of a text uh, where we can see lists and in the framework of my interpretation. Um, so, yeah, I try to summarize it and to not fall into much technical vocabulary, but then uh, there is a you know, <laughs> there's a certain amount of vocabulary that I need to use. I hope it's going to be uh, understandable to most. So to begin with, um, for the introduction, as spiders draw webs, human builds mis list most naturally. The Hindu Brihara Nyaka Upanishad pushes the metaphor further, stating that the universe itself is casted out of a hidden self, a Hartman, as a web out of a spider. It reads, just as a thread is sent forth from a spider, just as sparks fly up from a fire, verily, just from this essence, this Atman, springs all the breath, all the worlds, all the gods, and all beings. The hidden identity of this is the real behind the real. The world of the Briharanyaka Upanishad is a unified web of manifestation, the ultimate identity of which ever hides behind the real the networks of self-identification, which conventionally determines the web's internals, the human world. More often than not, humans trap themselves within their own nets in the world of the Gnostic Yogas, which I am presenting in this talk. That net in which we all trapped ourselves in one way or another is referred to as samsara, the flow of conventional existence with its cycles of life, death, and rebirth, an endless list of fragmentary experiences. But in that context, what I argue is that as spiritual practice, Gnostic Yoga teaches one how to disentangle oneself from the nets of conceptual, conceptual projection and identification through list analysis and list discrimination, a ritual practice of philosophy which involves pivotal operations of the mind. These operations are intellectual rituals formulated in abstract metaphysical jargon, they are performed with an entirely codified sociocultural environment, a given temporal, aesthetic, or biological situation, for example. These operations form the world symbolically offered and sacrificed by the Gnostic. Borrowing from Hegel's notions of determinate negation, what in German he calls Auf Eben, I read the philosophical rituals of Gnostics contemplative as embodied practices that aim to establish a determinate negation of the world as symbolically represented in scriptures, where the negated cosmos is not only sacrificed in the flames of reasoning, but rescued in the process. When I talk of spiritual exercises, I am borrowing the expression from the French classicists and philosopher Pierre Hadot, who applied the expression in the context of the philosophical practices of classical Greco-Roman thinkers. The expression has now become commonplace in the context of South Asian philosophical practices too. For example, while discussing the philosophical programs of, Buddhist, of the Buddhist philosopher Vasubandhu, the eminent scholar of Indian philosophy, Jonathan Gennady, observed that if philosophy is to have any practical consequence, 
It must also demonstrate that there is a way to alter the stance we adopt, that this stance is not necessitated by our very nature. It would be naive to think that it is entirely voluntary. Clearly, I cannot simply choose to look upon my thoughts as if they are all alien presences, not least because I could not regard that choice itself in the same way. So Buddhism implies that philosophy is dependent on the existence of techniques of mental cultivation, spiritual exercises in the vocabulary of Pierre Hadot. What I present in my work as a ritual component inextricably constituting the practice of Gnostic philosophy, the practice of internalizing and negating philosophy, is a pivotal analytical element to any theorizations of such techniques of mental cultivation and spiritual exercises mentioned by Gennery and Ado. For ritual transformation is unavoidably embedded, sorry, unavoidably enabled by a discursive and aesthetic use of taxonomy, which spans both ritual practices and philosophical speculation. List making is an aesthetic ritual. It configures reality, at least that reality uh, of the list maker. List making may even be seen as a cognitive prerequisite or prototype of every ritual act. A list compiler creates relationships between disparate elements of the cosmos, just as a ritualist does through his or her activity. No ritual escapes the form and repetition of the list. Rituals are built on series of choices, themselves made over a sequence of perceived categories, conveying certain information, a taxonomy of sort, a worldview. Because ritual is embedded in daily life, it infuses routine with a sense of purpose, of meaning, by keeping the performer busy with a certain goal-oriented mindset, where he or she may feel like an active agent of his or her own destiny and by extension of that of the universe in which the ritual takes place. The total ritualization of life South Asian Gnosticism promotes through renunciation is meaningful and successful within the logic of a kind of metamagic. It can also be seen as a totalistic science of being, a science of life, the normalization and internalization of non-conventional cognition and behavior. It is within this Gnostic context of a ritual practice of philosophy as a way of life that I highlight the importance of taxonomy as a mean of knowledge transmission, formation, and transformation. I take Gnostic doctrinal lists as artifacts representative of epistemic conventions which were used as pedagogy in contemplative studies. These lists appear to the language of Gnostic philosophical literature as media for the creation and transmission of a precise knowledge and behavior. They form concepts meant to facilitate and justify philosophical renunciation. I propose that the memorization, analysis, and negation of a palliative taxonomy, oh, yeah of a palliative taxonomy rooted in spiritual study constitutes a basic framework or threefold framework common to spiritual exercises taking place in the context of South Asian Gnostic yogas. The last point, the ultimate negation of the taxonomical mind of conceptuality altogether, particularly uh, distinguishes Gnosticism from other forms of Gnostic practices and South Asian philosophies. As intellectual as the exercise may appear, it is based on textual study and doctrinal internalization. It is a contemplative practice with its own aesthetics and ritual dimensions. Taxonomy is first introduced by agnostics to allow for taxonomical thinking to reveal itself, to be captured in flight within the projective processes of the mind, so as to be progressively neutralized through dialectical analysis and eventually pacified of its harmful effects and harmful elements, greed, aversion, ignorance, and so on, through conceptual dissolution. In their book on taxonomy, matching, using background knowledge, linked data, semantic web, and heterogeneous repositories, Heiko Angerman and Neil Ramsam 
while defining the nature of taxonomy clarify its relevance to science. They say, taxonomies are sets of categories more or less systematically organized in sequences. Written in list form, they depict different hierarchies of formation or formation for evaluative purposes, basically to record, organize, and predict features of, of objects or effects of causes. This is why taxonomy is so crucial to science. It frames descriptive language of an open set of phenomena in a way which can be useful to determine events and evaluate objects in an infinity of contexts. Taxonomy is the fruit of curiosity, the desire to know how and why to relate with one's environment in and out of. It is a quest for meaning. Taxonomy is the impulse for order, a tool to work upon chaos. In some, taxonomies are descriptive analogical discourses on a set of phenomena meant to account for what they are made of and to predict their behaviors in various contexts. Within science, this discourse seeks to capture a level of order pertaining to the natural world. In this context, taxonomy approximates the world out there. It presupposes that nature has an inherent order which we can grasp, organize in analogical lists, forms, and use to our benefit. Concerned with the rules at play behind natural order, scientific taxonomies nonetheless share crucial features with other non-scientific taxonomies, such as ritual or mythological taxonomies, for example. They are inherently normative in that they seek to set standards of behavior to legitimize through categorization and classification a way of dealing with and talking about certain things, categories. In biology, the ordering of organisms into group is made on the basis of their relationship. For example, these relationships may be genetic, evol evolutionary, or they may simply refer to similarities of phenotypes. This is also true for taxonomy, broadly speaking, beyond the natural sciences. Taxonomists, be they scientists, poets, or philosophers, are busy capturing the relationships between things, their likeness and similarities which they use to draw general patterns of analogy and correspondence, rules of nature and social conventions. In the same vein, Robert E. Belknap, in his book, The List, The Use and Pleasures of, Categoli Cata sorry, the Use and Pleasures of Cataloging, points out that in the order of things, Michel Foucault observed that it is partial identities or resemblances that make a taxonomy possible. But partial likeness, Similarity enable metaphor, the relational systems of both taxonomy and metaphor are based on connecting the similarities between things that are different. Thus, beyond its dry application in the natural sciences, taxonomy also has aesthetic value. It allows for a symbolization of the world, a binding of different features and meaning through metaphors, analogies, comparison, and so on. By putting random objects in relation through listing, taxonomy allows us to predict what is hidden in between the interests of potential contacts and the hazards of adventure. It imbues reality with deeper meaning beyond its literal interpretation, that of the untrained, the uncultivated. Taxonomy is the seed of culture, what Umberto Eco perceived in the list form itself. According to the famous paleontologist George Gaylord Simpson, taxonomy, which is ordering per excellence, has eminent aesthetic value. He says, like many other sciences, taxonomy is really a combination of a science, most strictly speaking, and of an art. It is scientific, sorry, its scientific side is concerned with reaching approximation, hopefully believed to be successively closer as the science progresses towards understanding of relationships present in nature. The recognition and arrangement of tax at various levels has a scientific content, but it is also largely intermingled with art, requiring human contrivance and ingenuity. It has already been mentioned that even if interrelationship in a group of animals were completely known, and even if there were a complete agreement about the scientific principles to be applied, innumerable different classifications could be made consistent with those interrelationships and valid under those principles. 
selection among those alternatives is decidedly an art. By insisting on the artistic dimension of taxonomy, Simpson highlights the fact that even when it carries a scientific discourse, taxonomy is fabricated, approximative, and not ultimate truth. In science, such theories are valid so long as they withstand rigorous scrutiny and a passage of experience, so long as they are the best suited to perform a given function within a certain paradigm. The Austrian British philosopher of science, Karl Raymond Popper, would stress so long as they can be falsified. As a study of taxonomical practice in South Asian Gnostic spiritual exercises, focusing on philosophical lists, my work engaged with an ancient dialogical and ritual world where the aesthetic use of taxonomy not only impacts cognitive processing, semantic conditions, and sociocultural conditions of production, but where it is equally used in a somewhat antinomian manner for the transformation or subversion of the same. I suggest that South Asian Gnostic authors were not only aware of the power of taxonomy in shaping one's reality, but harnessed it for their self-sacrificial project of renunciation. It is in this particular subversive use of taxonomy in Gnostic philosophical exercises, which I argue, I argue remains of utmost significance for us today in the studies of religion, for example, beyond the minute elements included in each and every sectarian taxonomy. Four, it sustained a culture of being, a transformative psychagogy, and a vision of freedom radically challenging our customary habits and preconceptions. Obviously, taxonomy is not only of concern for the natural sciences, it pervades the humanities as well. For example, early on, sociology developed its own approaches to taxonomy, an outlook which is pivotal to the present book. Beyond Michel Foucault, this sociological perspective is captured by Bruce Lincoln in his book, Discourse and the Construction of Society, Comparative Studies of Myth, Ritual, and Classification. Therein, Bruce Lincoln expounds that among students of taxonomy, it was Durkheim and Maus who first insisted on the social foundations of classificatory logic. More recently, Pierre Bourdieu has contributed to our understanding of the ways in which taxonomic systems provide ideological mystification for socio-political realities. Yet, there remains those who, taking their lead from Immanuel Kant, maintain that taxonomy is primarily an epistemological instrument, that is, a means of gathering, sorting, and processing knowledge about the external, especially the natural world. For all that the epistemological functions of taxonomy are unde undeniable, placing primary emphasis on them obscures the fact that all knowers are themselves objects of knowledge as well as subjects insofar as they cannot and do not stand apart from the world that they seek to know. One consequence of this, and far from the least important, is that categor categorizers come to be categorized according to their own categories. The last part of Lincoln's remark is of particular interest to me. It insists that taxonomies do not only organize the natural world, but that they also configure the taxonomers themselves by discursively shaping their immediate inner and social reality. In this way, taxonomies once internalized by individuals legitimize social realities. Obviously, taxonomy beyond the merely recording order can also be used to challenge and establish one by reversal or negation, for example. This is perhaps why or the main reason why I suggest South Asian Gnostic spiritual exercises unavoidably use various taxonomical schemes throughout their contemplative practices. Like taxonomies, knowledge is plastic. It can be formed and transformed through training. Contemplative studies form and transform the connoisseur. This is the very premise of spiritual exercises. Changes brought within one's knowledge one's acquired taxonomy unavoidably reverberate within oneself and one's behavior, as there is an intimate relation between the known and its knower. To give an approximate date for the beginnings of the rise to fame of jnana yoga, what I call the yogas of knowledge, beyond its early mentions in the Hindu Upanishads, here I give you some titles, yeah. 
Um, I take the perfection of wisdom literature of Mahayana Buddhism and especially its systematic enunciation credited to the philosopher Nagarjuna, the so first and second century CE, to be an historical marker, followed by the theories attributed to the Jaina philosopher Kunda Kunda, second to fifth century CE, and the Hindu philosopher Gaudapada, fifth to seventh century CE. These thinkers, or rather their textual corpora, brought to the fore and radicalized a latent tendency in South Asian ritual speculation in order to insist on the sociological primacy and superiority of knowledge. And this radical and yet institutional gnosticism, which equally includes the kind of philosophy formulated in the Samkhyakarika, well, fourth to fifth century, which provided the metaphysical backbones of the now popular Yoga Sutra, Knowledge becomes both the means of sacrifice and its purpose. In brief, it is the knowledge of both how the conventional order of the world holds together and, in contrast, the knowledge as to why this order is illusory from an ultimate standpoint, which finally brings ritual success from an agnostic point of view. There appears to have been a subtle semiotic shift from the renunciation of the early wandering ascetics of the second half of the first millennium BCE, for whom the early teachings of archetypical figures like the Jina and the Buddha were formulated, to that of the later monastic institutions already well established and prosperous by the fifth century CE in India. At least it is the later Gnostic literature which interests in, so in the later Gnostic literature, which interests me here, renunciation comes to me not only the abandonment of outer worldly objects and their related desires, along with the outer sacrificial performances meant to fulfill such desires, the cleansing of karma and the taming of the senses, but especially it involves the determinate negation of inner objects, the realm of beliefs, opinion, and psyche. Gnostic renunciation in this radical ritual context can be said to culminate in the relinquishing of views. It is here, I argue, where philosophical practice plays a pivotal function. The, um, now, I would like to uh, show some, I mean, a concrete illustration of such lists, right, uh, in a uh, uh, in the Buddhist context, what I chose, because I think this text uh, is rather well known. So please bear with me. That would be uh, the concluding part of this uh, of this talk. So um, I chose this text of the Bhagavati Prajna Paramita Hridaya Sutra, or the Sutra of the Heart of the Noble Lady of Perfect Wisdom, which is most com commonly known as the Heart Sutra, is recited daily by nuns, monks, monks and lay folks throughout the Mahayana vehicle or the great vehicle of the Buddhist tradition. The text became the most frequently used scriptures of the Mahayana world and is a daily reminder that ancient South Asian Gnosticism continues to reverberate loud in the lives of millions today. Composed as a dialogue like most sutras, its primary focus is to teach the heart of Mahayana Buddhism in terms of its view, that is, from the perspective of the understanding, knowledge or wisdom sustaining the tradition. It is that knowledge, that of emptiness or shunyata, which stands as the dominant themes of the Heart Sutra, which is to be internalized by the adept of the Prajna Paramita, the uh, literature on wisdom through ritual training. Since the Heart Sutra presents the Buddhist teaching in a condensed format, summed up in a few lists of technical term, I believe it is most useful to return that technical language. So you will see, I will share this uh, text, very, I mean, parts of it, with its technical language and the translation. Um, structurally speaking, the Art Sutra is a list of technical lists. It is a fractal matrix. Let's read uh, these texts and pay attention to all the many lists that will come through. So I start with the, let's say, verse 1.4. So just uh, because time is short, it says, then with the Buddha's approval, Venerable Shariputra asked the noble Bodhisattva, the Buddhist saint, Avalokiteshvara, sir, how should sons of noble family train if they wish to engage in the practice of the profound Prajna Paramita? The Bodhisattva, Noble Avalokiteshvara, replied to Venerable Shariputra, 
by saying, Dear Shariputra, sons of noble family who wish to engage in the practice of the profound Prajna Paramita should see things in this manner. They should correctly observe the five aggregate of experience, which in Buddhism constitute the self, uh, to be empty of inherent nature. Form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. And form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, perception, mental formation, and consciousness are emptiness. Therefore, Shariputra, all dharmas are emptiness. They are without characteristics, unborn, unceasing, neither impure nor pure, and not complete. Therefore, Shariputra, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no perception, no formation, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no texture, and no phenomenon. There is no element of the eye up to no element of the mind and further up to no element of the mind consciousness. There is no knowledge, no ignorance, no end of ignorance, just like there is no end of old age and death. There is no distress, no origins of distress, no cessation of distress, no path, no wisdom, no attainment and no non-attainment. Thus, dear Shariputra, since the Bodhisattva has no attainment, he is taking refuge in the Prajna Paramita. Because his mind has no mental veil, he is not frightened. Having utterly gone beyond the unreal, he is fixed on Nirvana, the cessation. All the Buddhas who desire, so all the Buddhas who reside in the three times have likewise fully awakened to unsurpassed perfect total wisdom by relying upon the Prajna Paramita. While the first part of Avalokiteshvara's contemplative instruction were concerned with the emptiness of one's microcosm, one's five constitutive aggregate, the skandhas, behind one's false sense of self and identity, the second part of his discourse points out the emptiness of everything else, so that self and other may be equally understood as empty of any inherent nature. In perfect analogy, akin to the micro, microcosm, the macrocosm is equally empty. Thus, from the negation of the self, the heart sutra moved to determinately negate the entire Buddhist doctrine and path, the entire macrocosm as laid out in the scriptures, leaving nothing but emptiness. Like the aggregate of experience constitutive of one's individuality, each and every phenomena is said to be without the determining characteristic, allowing one to distinguish it from others. Since nothing has any absolute characteristic, no ultimately real taxonomical value, one cannot discriminate between the pure and impure phenomena, nor posit some, that some are deficient in some ways, while others are able to stand on their own. All these features negated by the Heart Sutra were categories that determine the various taxa constituting the phenomenal taxonomies of earlier Buddhism, allowing one to distinguish what to cultivate or the, under certain condition and what to avoid, what is wholesome and what is unwholesome, etc. Negating this fragmentating taxonomy en bloc, the Heart Sutra instructs one to contemplate emptiness instead. But it is noteworthy that it does so through listing earlier classical canonical list, and not by completely rejecting their terminology and meaning, nor by inventing a new better one. The earlier canon is preserved and perfected, as the apophatic rhetoric suggests, within the Prajna Paramita negation. Its negation comes to complete the renunciation already established in the canon by abandoning even that canon leaving one totally disinterested and detached from worldly phenomena. In the Buddhist Prajnaparamita context, the early canon, what stands for Buddhist metaphysics, come to represent the first degree of one's internalization of renunciation. Its taxonomical map of representation is first memorized and studied as a sacrificial framework, whereas the Prajnaparamita itself becomes its perfection the accomplished 
sacrificial act where what is sacrificed here is, if you want, the early canon. Renunciation is what the Prajna Paramita ritual framework is structured to produce. The Prajna Paramita perfects the renunciation promoted by the earlier canon by dissolving it altogether into emptiness so that renunciation becomes complete, having totally renounced even to itself, renouncing renunciation, leaving nothing at all to be grasped onto. I hope what I presented was intelligible. Um, and this was the end. I mean, this is the end of my presentation. I thank you for your uh, time. <laughs>